I live in the town of Arlington. I grew up in the town of Weston. Um, but I consider all of New England and Eastern New York State my territory for just connecting to the outdoors through my taste buds because there's edible wild plants all over the place. So here in the Lakes region or in the White Mountains or along the seacoast or in the cities, there's edible wild plants everywhere. So it's really fun, as I said, to know this stuff. And um, now, uh, uh, among all the plants that are out there that are edible, there are two basic categories. There's the native plants and the non-native plants. And I do treat them differently in terms of how I think about gathering them. Because native plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. The animals rely upon them for food is some other important portion of their life cycle. So it's important if you're going to gather native plants in the wild to not take too much or you could upset the ecological balance. So that's, so um, now, um, in terms of native plants, I need to give a shout out to Native Americans, the folks that have been here for thousands of years, and they're the ones that figured out how to eat stuff that's native to this area. But boy, am I grateful for that. Because of that, we don't have to just walk down the trail, pop stuff in our mouth, and see what happens. All that experimentation has been done already, so we can, uh, I'm very grateful to have the knowledge trickle down to me that they are the ones that originally figured it out. And also, um, um, so, and, and yes, uh, where we are in, in this whole area was indigenous territory, and there are indigenous people still here, and I've had the great fortune and honor to uh, collaborate with them on various things, and that's really wonderful. Uh, but let me, uh, if I were to draw your attention to a particular wonderful source, it's this book right here, Braiding Sweetgrass. So we're in the library, we should talk about a book. This book is one of my all-time favorite books. It's written by an indigenous botanist, Robin Wall Kimmer, who I have the pleasure to know personally. And, um, and um, one of the things she talks about in here is the honorable harvest. There's actually an entire chapter. It's basically about foraging. And so she's got these principles of the honorable harvest. And she suggests that you might even consider making a laminated card of this and taking it with you as you're going outside and thinking about, OK, should I pick this plant? What protocol should I use? And stuff like that. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments of foraging. So, uh, and as I say, this is particularly important when you're talking about native species. But depending upon the part of the plant you're harvesting, there are going to be different impacts. For, for example, berry, pucky, berry picking and nut gathering, along with mushroom hunting, they'll get into, a, into in a second. Those are relatively benign types of foraging activities because all you're doing is gathering the seed dispersal portion of the organism. There's often a lot of those around, so if you gather some, it's not usually that big a deal. But if you're digging plants up to harvest them or stripping all the leaves or flowers off plants to harvest them, you can imagine it could be a lot more traumatic for the plant. So keep that in mind. Um, just a second, uh, just so you know, we do have that book available in the library. Oh, wonderful. Uh, it's unavailable right now, so we yes. it out. And we also have an audio, and it's unavailable. Oh, okay. We do have All it right. here. Okay. Now, now, having said that, <laughs> you, you, you'll pardon the expression. I have my own personal copy because I've written all over it. And every time I read through it, and I've read through it at least three times, I underline new sections that I missed before. So, you know, if you're one of those people that likes to, you know, really get tactile with your literature, uh, you know, something that's so intensely meaningful to you that you're compelled to do that, then obviously you wouldn't want to do that to library books. So you want to get your own. Okay, but anyway, but certainly you could get it, and, and, and after you start reading, you're going to say, you know, I need to take notes on this, so I better have my own copy. All right, so the other thing is this forbearance and restraint that, uh, you know, so not only knowing what you can eat, but how to interact with it in a respectful way, that's very much built into Native American philosophy and interaction respect for plants. So that's a good thing to follow. And the other thing I'm grateful to Native Americans for is the presence of edible wild plants in our landscapes because they tended the landscape using fire and actually deliberately planting species that were useful to them. Sometimes, you know, utilitarian like species they'd use for cordage or, or, or uh, other purposes, but certainly a lot of edible wild plants are here because Native Americans deliberately planted them here. So I'm grateful for that too. All right, now, uh, as I said, native species, you have to show forbearance and restraint to make sure you don't pick too much. Then at the other end of the spectrum, we have the edible weeds and invasive species. So, I mean, here's the Massachusetts guy. You get similar information online for New Hampshire. So this book right here uh, talks about what are considered to be the 66 most ecologically disruptive non-native plants that occur in Massachusetts. And the New Hampshire list and the Massachusetts list are very, very similar. It's basically the same plants. So um, 
the main bad thing invasive plants do is they usurp the habitat of the native species, so uh, that's not good. But if there's a silver lining to the invasive cloud, perhaps is the fact that a lot of the species in this book are edible. In fact, out of the 66 species covered in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we all picked and ate as many of these as we possibly could. I'm totally serious about that. This is guilt-free foraging. You can't pick too many invasive species, provided you're not spreading the plants around in the process. And I will have several invasives in my talk today, but I just want to skip ahead. Oh, so there's a few of these are going to be in the show tonight because they grow around here. This one, does anybody know this plant? Okay, yeah. so some people call this plant Russian olive. The actual name for it is autumn olive. Russian olive fruits are more of a kind of a yellowish, grayish color. If they're red like this, it's autumn olive. So in an ordinary year, you'd see lots of fruits like this on the bushes, which you have in Guilford. I saw them on the way yeah. here. There's a bunch just up at Gunstock, uh, you know, at the base, near the base lodge for the, the ski <laughs> area. Um, so, uh, so ordinarily this time of year, I'm harvesting bushes that are loaded like this with fruit. Not this year, though, because of the drought that we had. It just uh, the, the fruit just dropped off the plants. The plants couldn't hold on to them. So, anyway, so you 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 maybe you'll be lucky and you'll find some. I think I saw some heading up on Route 106, uh, uh, you know, uh, down in Belmont or something like that that still had fruit on it. But, but in general, I've given up on finding autumn olives this year. But Last year, I found a whole bunch, and what I do is I puree the, this fruit and I dehydrate it, and I make a fruit leather from it. So that's what's in here. So please feel free to take a piece and pass it around. All right. So um, so my, my photos are organized chronologically by foraging opportunities. So I'm going to start in the spring and then move through the summer and then where we are now and then finish up a little past where we are now. All right. We're ready to go? Start with plants? Okay. All right. So. Now, now you folks up in New Hampshire, you're probably, you know, very, have a lot of woods floor, and you know your ferns, and you know what fern this is and stuff. But where I'm from in Eastern Mass, probably one of the biggest mistakes that novice foragers make is with fiddleheads. And, okay, so let's just uh, get in our time travel vehicles and pretend we're, you know, it's next to April, and you're walking woods in the spring, and you see a bunch of ferns at that curled up stage, which almost all ferns do, and there's many, many species of ferns. And so, you know, what I, the story I hear is, yeah, we were walking down the trail, we saw these fiddleheads, we see, oh, fiddleheads, boy, they look an awful lot like what we've seen for sale in the stores and on the restaurant menus, so they pick them and they bring them home and they cook it up and it tastes horrible and they say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvest the wrong species of fern. I only know two species of fern that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one. This is the ostrich fern. So where you're going to find this one is alluvial floodplain soil, and I'll show a photo of that. So like along the Merrimack River, tributaries in Merrimack mm -hmm. is where I've seen this uh, fern. And um, now uh, uh, you'll see it characteristically grows in a vase-shaped clump like that. And so there'll be typically a half a dozen per clump. And if you cut each stem across section, you'll see it forms a U-shape because there's a gouge that runs down the inner part of the stem. And then uh, you see those brown papery scales on the curled up parts that flake off really easily with your fingers. So it's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. So you look for that. And this is a good time to talk about uh, how to harvest native plants sustainably. So, um, so if you see fiddleheads for sale in a produce section or on a restaurant menu, I don't know anybody that's cultivating ostrich fern fiddleheads. So if you see them there, that means they were gathered from the wild. And that's not inherently bad. I mean, that's what the whole theme of this talk is about. But unfortunately, what some people do, the unscrupulous people do, they get a little greedy and are probably you know, needing to make as much money as they can, they'll pick every single ostrich fern they find in the patch. And that does a lot of damage to the rise of You can actually kill the plants by harvesting them that hard. So if you pick one or two little coconut plants per clump, that's a sustainable level of harvest. If you let the other ones grow out, the plant will have no trouble doing OK there. So uh, that's the advice I give for that one. And uh, just to get back to Native Americans for uh, one more second, and that is to say that, um, and you know, this is our fault because we discourage Native Americans from continuing to speak their indigenous languages. Uh, but in those languages were all kinds of wonderful terms that uh, in, that embodied, you know, all the wonderful observations of nature that they made. Uh, and it showed up in their language. And I just want to give an example of how that. Uh, works for this ostrich fern. So I learned this from Nancy Turner, this ethnobotanist from British Columbia, who said that the Maliseet tribe, which 
their traditional homeland is on what's now the main uh, New Brunswick border. Their term for the ostrich term fiddlehead is the same exact word they used to describe the circling motion a dog makes before it lies down. And that is amazing to draw that similarity. I'm not even sure my brain works that way to have seen that, but you know, once you hear it, it's like, of course, yeah. And uh, so, uh, so I, I celebrate where we still have you know, some knowledge of the language, but it also makes me sad about all the other wonderful descriptions there were in indigenous languages that, that may have been lost uh, through the centuries. Okay, so here's that alluvial floodplain soil, that really silty soil. This isn't the only place ostrich ferns will grow, especially when I, when I head further west and the pH ticks up a little bit, especially in Vermont, but also in western, a little bit west of here, you'll, you'll run into the ostrich ferns kind of, some kind of, you know, in perched areas where glacial lakes might have existed and dumped some alluvial soil. So you see them there too. And then the fifth thing to look for is the fertile fronds, the spore-bearing fronds, these guys right here. And if you cut their stems in cross-section, they also form the U-shape. So you see all five of those characteristics together. There's absolutely nothing other than the ostrich fern. All right, now if you've ever bought ostrich ferns at the store, the fiddleheads, and brought them home and cooked them up and not be very impressed with them, you might want to try this technique, which is amply demonstrated to me by this naturalist, Beth Basler, who took us to a patch of fiddleheads growing along the Connecticut River, and she brought her camp stove with her to the fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them. And they were truly exquisite that way. All right, anybody know what this plant is? This is a plant you can recognize in the dark. This is a plant you can recognize even if you were blind. Why is that? Because it would sting you if you touched it with your bare fingers. So this is stinging nettle. And um, if you've never been stung by stinging nettle, and I suspect that it's a lot of you in the audience, it's not like poison ivy where you find out a day or two later you got into it, you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. But the good news is the sting rarely lasts for more than an hour and there are antidotes and I'll show them to you in the show. But stinging nettle is a wonderfully edible plant. It's one of the first things I'm harvesting in the spring, uh, like the second week of April. And this is the stage I'm harvesting and when it first comes up, it's about six inches tall. And I will just take the top cluster of leaves off every plant and throw that in a bag and bring it home and then throw it in a bowl to wash it off and then I'll take some tongs so I'm not touching it still and I'm just flinging the nettle tops into a cooking pot and I'm more or less steaming the nettle tops in the water that's still clinging to them from the washing process. It takes about five or six minutes and it will shrink quite a bit but once they're done that steaming process completely disarms the sting and actually turns the chemical that causes the sting into a protein. So it makes the plants about 7% protein which is pretty high for leafy green vegetable Plus, stinging nettles have all kinds of vitamins in them and minerals like calcium. It's the closest thing I know of to a vitamin pill in the plant world. It's really good for you. So after you steam the nettle greens, you can eat them just plain. The flavor's kind of like split peas. Or you can incorporate them into different dishes. So here's cream of stinging nettle soup. Sounds like something you might have made in the old Adams Family TV show. And it's um, recipes in my book. It's very easy. Just uh, uh, the uh, sauteed potatoes and onions, uh, throw it into the blender with the steamed nettle greens and, um, and chicken stock and half and half if you're not uh, a vegan. And it's really good. And then here are stinging nettle balls. So this is the spinach ball recipe from the 1950s when you use Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together. <laughs> and you can just substitute the steamed uh, nettle greens uh, for the spinach. It works great in that recipe. All right, anybody know what this plant is? All right, so uh, usually people know it's a mint, and one of the ways to tell is that the stem is square, it has four equal sides to it, and also the leaves go opposite from each other on the stem, and the combination of the square stems and opposite leaves and the aromatic quality in the plant, that tells you it's a member of the mint family, and whether or not, and I'm happy to tell you there's no poisonous members of the mint family grow around here. So whether or not you use it and how you use it just depends on the flavor. So uh, this is a plant that you all know, catnip. And catnip is a garden plant, but occasionally goes feral, grows wild, and I will see it uh, growing on its own. And catnip has the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people <laughs> will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you could use the leaves fresh or dried. I put it in the show next to nettles because I think it looks a lot like the stinging nettle, uh, but uh, this doesn't have any stinging hairs. Nettle doesn't have the square stem, so that's how you can tell them apart. All right, here's one of the antidotes to the stinging stem and nettle. It's also an edible plant. It's called curled or curly dock. And it has these undulating leaf margins. I don't know if you can see that in the back. It's very wavy like that. And, um, and so to eat this one, it's available in the spring and near the end of the summer. 
uh, it will look like that. And so you just pick the tender leaves from the center of the plant. And I find them to be a little bitter. So what I'll do is get a pot of water boiling in the stove, throw the nettle green, uh, sorry, throw the curled off greens in there and boil them for just 20 seconds. That's called blanching. And then you pull them out and then you can use them just like uh, cooked spinach. So for example, the spanakopita, the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough and the feta cheese, the uh, blanched uh, curled off greens work really well as a substitute for spinach in that recipe. So does the steamed nettle greens, by the way. And uh, okay, and um, yeah, so the antidote to some stinging nettle, you just grab the leaves and scrunch them up and get the juice out and then apply that juice to the place where you're stung and it helps make the sting go away. Okay, so this species may be among the most hated plant species on earth. Japanese knotweed because it is so um, tough to eradicate once it gets established. And two of the places that you're likely to run into it in Guilford are along streams, rivers and streams, and along roadways. And why is that? Because this is a plant that thrives on disturbance and it reproduces mainly by its rhizomes, by its root systems. And the way this happens with streams is, as you know, in the winter, the, the rivers and streams freeze up. And then the late winter, the ice begins to break loose, and you have these big chunks of ice floating down the river, and occasionally a big chunk of ice will slam into the riverbank where there's some knotweed, dislodge a piece of the rhizome, and it'll float down the stream and then wash up in a new place and establish a new colony that way. The second, and perhaps you've noticed this, you'll be on this rural road, and you'll see a little patch of knotweed, then 100 yards further down the road, another little patch of knotweed, then 100 yards further down the road, another little patch of knotweed. So my theory about how that happens is snow plows is that snow plows will occasionally get below the surface of the snow and dig up a bit of dirt. And if they do that where there's not weed patch, a little bit of rhizome might ride on the plow blade down the road and then fall off and start a new colony. Mm -hmm. All right. So ecologically, this plant is bad news because where it grows, it pretty much you know, wipes out anything else that was there and it forms a not monoculture. But this is a delicious plant. So, um, so it still has its leaves on it now if you know where it's growing in town. Uh, or elsewhere in the Lakes District. Uh, but um, um, so it's not edible now, but remember where it is. And then in the spring, what you want to look for is all the dried reddish brown stalks from last year's growth. In the middle of all of that, you're going to see these shoots that look like this. And they'll be, you know, green shoot, very soft and pliable, little red dots on it, cluster leaves at the top. And that's what I call the wild asparagus stage. So you can just snap it off at ground level and just steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But my favorite stage to harvest this plant is what I call the wild rhubarb stage when it gets a little bit taller, foot and a half or two feet tall, and I'm finding the fattest sprouts I can, cut them at ground level, and then you know you end up with a shoot like that, and I'll lop off the top cluster leaves, and then I'll carefully peel the outer layer off, the skin, because the skin is stringy, there's nothing poisonous about it. But if you don't do that and you use it, you, the stringy bits might get caught in your mouth. So, so you peel the knotweed stalks by taking the skin up. Now, the knotweed stalks are hollow, so you don't want to peel too deeply, or all you have left is the hole. You just want to get the very <laughs> outer there off. And then you end up with a crisp green tube, which is tart and juicy. You can eat it right on the spot if you want. It's kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up like I've done to the pieces in the bowl here and use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So this plant's actually related to rhubarb. So. Here is my strawberry knotweed pie that I love to make, recipes in my book, and virtually everybody I feed this to say, this is even better than strawberry rhubarb pie. Mm. All right, so, but you might be looking at that pie and say, well, I don't know, I'm not a very confident pie baker, and that latticework top, I don't know if I could pull that off. So I'm gonna show you a way to use the knotweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. You just take those little hollow knotweed pieces and fill them with like a flavored cream cheese or a salmon mousse in a little tart edible container, and they're delicious and fun, and, and that's another way to use it. You do not have to know how to cook to do that. Oh. All right, so here's another invasive species called garlic mustard. I don't get quite as excited about eating this one as I do the knotweed, but you can eat it. It's a very pungent, garlic-flavored wild broccoli, basically, is what it is. And so uh, I find that the yummiest part of this plant is the second year's growth. If you're just going to eat the stems, they're relatively mild, and you could eat them raw, chop them up, and, and use them in a stir-fry, for example. All right, uh, I could have taken this photo in New Hampshire because I see a lot of this in farm fields in New Hampshire around late April, early May. And this is a plant called wintercress. And uh, it has yellow flowers when it blooms, but you want to harvest it before it blooms. And actually, my favorite part to eat are these guys right here. And they look like broccoli rob. And you cook it like broccoli rob, and it tastes like broccoli rob. So that's really nice. Anybody know what this plant is? 
So when I give this talk to garden clubs, everybody yells out, Flux! And they're all wrong. <laughs> so it's very easy to tell this plant apart from Phlox if you know what to look for. Okay, All Phlox family flowers have five petals. These just have four petals. There's another cousin in the mustard family, as, as were the last two plants I showed you, called Dame Srocket. It's another invasive species, another guilt-free foraging opportunity. And you see how it comes in white and purple color? That's almost always how you see it in the wild, the two colors together. So it's an easy plant to recognize at a distance. And, um, and although the whole plant's edible, I like to eat the flowers because it's fun to eat flowers. And, and although uh, the white flowers and the purple flowers have the same flavor, I tend to just use the purple flowers because purple's a funner color than white. And you can use those just to decorate other foods you're serving or put into a salad or anything you want. And they're quite tasty. They have kind of garlicky, radishy, sweet flavor. Uh, quite good. All right, does anybody know where I took this photo? All right, I'll just tell you, it's a spot I bet you most of you have been to. It's, you're driving north on Route 16, you've just run all the gauntlet of the outlet stores in North Conway, and you get past <laughs> all of that, and you emerge from all that commotion, and then you look off across this field, and you see the presidential range, and if you're there Memorial Day weekend, you might see the Dan Lyons and Mount Washington still with snow on it. But the point of the photo is to talk to you about dandelions. Dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of wild food than anything else, and the story usually goes something like this. It's the spring, and you look out in your backyard, and you see all these dandelions blooming, and you say to yourself, I hear dandelions are edible. I should try them. So you go out to your yard, you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take one bite. It's incredibly bitter. You spit it out, and you say, yeah, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame, because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, when I start seeing whole field, fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, I'm not eating dandelions, except for the flowers, of course, but I'm not, you know. Generally, I'm, I, I want to harvest dandelions before they bloom. And it's actually the unopened flower buds that I consider to be uh, the best part of the plant. In fact, I consider dandelion flower buds to be among my favorite vegetables, period, cultivated in a while. The flavor's like a cross between corn, artichokes, Brussels sprouts, and spinach. And so how do you prepare them? So you just pick them off the plant, throw them in a bowl to wash them off, get a pot of water boiling in the stove, dump the dandelion buds in there, and cook them for 60 seconds. That's all they need. And then you can incorporate them into soups or omelets or casseroles. And before you do anything with them, before you even put any salt or butter on them, just try them plain. I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. And if you want to eat dandelion leaves, I think this is the right time to gather them. So when I'm picking the buds off the plant, if I see any tender leaves in the center of the plant, I'll harvest them too and prepare them the same way. Okay, so this photo is out of chronological sequence because this plant's still blooming now. So this is more of a summer blooming plant. It's just a very, very close relative to dandelion, which is why I put them in the show together. This is chicory. So the same parts are edible on a chicory that are edible on a dandelion. And the leaves, I'm sorry I don't have chicory leaves in this photo, but the leaves are really, really similar looking. So it's very possible that you could mix up and eat one instead of the other. Absolutely no harm in that at all because they're close relatives, they're edible the exact same way. Um, except chicory flowers get about this tall. You know, dandelions never get this tall. So if you're seeing a dandelion-like plant with a flower stalk that's this tall, you know that it's not dandelion, it's probably chicory. So um, these blue flowers are edible. They have almost no flavor, so why eat them? Because blue is an unusual food color, so it's fun to just snip the petals off and get that color into a salad. And uh, chicory leaves are edible in the spring or in the fall. And then chicory roots are probably the most well-known edible part of the plant. You actually make a drink from it. And this I'll explain in my book, but basically what you do is you gather up the roots. And this time of year from now until next spring is a good time to gather them because the plants have kind of sent food energy back down into the root as they winter over their, their perennial plants. So, um, so you'll get more yield of the coffee grounds than if you make it in the uh, summer. So, uh, all right, so you pull the roots up, you cut them into uh, pieces that are uh, pretty equivalent in size, and then spread them out in a cookie sheet, and then uh, roast them in an oven until they turn this uh, brittle and very aromatic uh, consistency, um, almost black in color. And then you take all of that and you throw it in a food processor and you grind it up to make the grounds. And I find that I only need about half the amount of grounds to make the same strength beverage as coffee grounds. Whatever device you use to make your coffee, your percolator, your plunger, whatever you're using, you can use the same device to make the chicory drink. And the chicory drink does taste remarkably like coffee, especially if you usually you drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory the same way, the flavor is really similar. One big difference is that there's no caffeine in chicory. So if you're one of these people who says, what's the point of drinking it if there's no caffeine in it? 
then the chickweed's just not gonna cut it for you. <laughs> All right, here's chickweed. So this is a spring and fall wild edible, so it is out now. And uh, I use it as a sprout substitute in a sandwich or a lettuce substitute in a salad, and it's quite good. <coughs> Violets are edible, violet leaves are edible, violet flowers are edible. You can candy the violet flowers and use those for decorating other things. Daisies are edible, although the tastiest part of a daisy are the leaves before the flowers come out. So you need to be able to recognize the plant at that stage. So I apologize, this photo is a little out of focus, but if you look at the daisy flower buds right here, they have a flat top to them and they have markings on them and it looks kind of like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. So look for that and then look for leaves that look like that. And that's what daisy plants look like. And I find daisy leaves can be so good just uh, straight into your mouth and thrown into a cell. I've never tried to cook with them. They're just really good, uh, just raw. Okay, this plant's quite common in this part of New Hampshire because this likes acidic soil, like what you have here. And this uh, sheep sorrel is a cousin of the French garden sorrel, so you can use it the same way. You can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it, and so on. Here's a completely unrelated plant with the same flavor. So this is called wood sorrel. Now here in the woods, in, in uh, the higher elevations, you might run into the native white wood sorrel, which uh, has a beautiful flower with the candy stripes on it. Um, uh, and that's edible too, but um, so is this one. So this is in the oxalis genus, so this is related to the house plant oxalis, related to star fruit. And uh, so any tender part of this plant you can eat. And, and um, now the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in this plant and the sheep sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid that might not be good to eat in humongous amounts. Like if we eat a gigantic salvo full of just either or both of these plants, it could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium. It could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you're eating in moderation with other things, it's perfectly fine. Okay, so here is peppergrass and poor man's pepper, two uh, species that look very similar, hard to tell apart, uh, but you don't need to tell them apart because they're related plants and they have the same flavor. And the flavor is in these little round seed pods like this, or uh, these round dish seed pods like this one. So this one has a short season availability in the spring, and this one is still out now. It's, it's, it's at this stage from like June to Thanksgiving. You'd be able to find it like this. And this peppergrass here is a great plant to remember if let's say you've got company coming over for dinner and they arrive and dinner isn't ready yet, or uh, you know, and anyway, they're starving, you need to feed them something. Go out in your yard, find the peppergrass, just strip those flat seed pods <laughs> off of the plant, mix it with a little cream cheese, spread that on crackers and feed that to them and they'll love it and forget all about the fact that dinner is ready. <laughs> okay, and uh, so a number of years ago, I was taking part in somebody else's natural history program and they were serving us lunch and they were manufacturing these roast beef and borsan sandwiches for us. And there was peppergrass growing right outside the building where the sandwiches are being uh, assembled. So I said to the leader, I said, hey, you've got peppergrass here. Why don't we add the seed pods to the sandwiches? She said, sure. So we did and everybody loved it. <laughs> okay, so when I make stuff from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. I don't insist that every ingredient be wild itself. Like when I make that strawberry knotweed pie, I don't have to use yak butter for the shortening. I can use regular butter, regular sugar, and the knotweed makes it a wild fish. But it is fun to make a salad completely from wild ingredients, which is what this one is here. Um, but I don't want to deter you from just throwing a few uh, violet flowers in a salad or dames rocket flowers in a salad. It's perfectly fine. You don't have to go extreme like I did here. So let me tell you what's in this salad. So we have some mustard, wild mustard flowers. Uh, that's in there. The blue purple stuff is the chicory flower. So in here are chickweed and wood sorrel and sheep sorrel, things like that bulking up the salad. And the little red berries are partridge berries. And then these things that look like little cherry tomatoes are ground cherries or husk tomatoes. So that's what partridge berries look like. You probably know this plant very common here in uh, uh, the Lakes region. Uh, these berries have virtually no flavor. So why use them? Because they're pretty. So I'll just put a few on top of a salad just to get that nice red color in there. And then here is the uh, uh, ground cherry. So this photo is also out of chronological sequence because uh, this root's available now. Um, now where you're gonna find it is uh, on the edge of a farm or a place where there are or were livestock, like uh, near a horse paddock, for example. So a sunny cultivated area, you're not gonna find this in the woods somewhere. <clears throat> and the foliage looks kind of like an eggplant, and it's not a coincidence because this is a cousin of eggplants. It's in the Solanaceae, so it's related to tomatoes. And the key thing is the fruit of the ground cherry is it's 
it's got husks around it. You see this papery husk? So you can't see this fruit unless you take this part off. So that's what it looks like when it's immature. And so when, when this is ripe, this is going to turn yellow and then a, a beige color, and the whole thing falls off the plant and the fruit continues to ripen inside the papery husk on the ground. That's why it's called ground cherry, because you actually check the ground underneath the plant to look for the fruit. And it tastes like a sweet cherry tomato. So if you're ever looking at a plant and you're able to see without doing anything, these little yellow tomato-like things, it could be the uh, poisonous look-alike to this plant, a plant called horse nettle. Uh, so uh, just remember that you have to, you know, if you're looking for ground cherries, you're not going to be able to see the fruit unless you take the, that papery covering off. Okay, so I am going to talk about mushrooms in the show. So uh, this is a good time to talk about uh, one basic thing, and that is, you might be wondering if any of you here are rank beginners, and I suspect there always are some in the audience. Just how risky is it to put something wild in my mouth? Could I get sick? Could I even die? And the answer is different whether you're talking about plants or mushrooms. So with plants, the risk of that happening is quite low because the vast majority of poisonous plants that grow around here taste horrible. So my advice is don't eat plants that taste bad. It doesn't mean that every edible wild plant is going to be delicious, straight from the bush or the vine or whatever. Some of them require some preparation. But if you see a plant you think is edible and you bring it home, you prepare it according to instructions, you get a big steaming plate in front of you, and you take a bite that doesn't taste good, you might not want to override that danger signal to your taste, but it might be given you. You might have made a mistake in identification, all right? Now, mushrooms, that rule does not apply at all. So we have a bunch of mushrooms out there with toxins in them, and at least six that could kill you. And there's nothing from the flavor whatsoever on those six most lethal mushrooms that gives you any advance warning before. So you could have this delicious mushroom meal one day and be dead several days later from liver and or kidney failure. So the risk of picking the wrong kind of mushroom and getting sick and possibly even dying is much, much greater than for plants. Having said that, you can range all the mushroom species that are in a line and cluster to one end of those species that are virtually impossible to confuse with anything poisonous versus those at the other end of the line that even the experts can't tell apart. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out if you gain experience and confidence, that's how you stay out of trouble. Everybody get that? Okay, so the main mushroom hunting season in New England goes from about the 4th of July until around now, and that's when you're gonna see the greatest quantity of variety of mushrooms, but this year has not been good because of the lack of rainfall. Last year was fabulous, because it rained a lot. So the pendulum, unfortunately, swung way to the other way. So uh, not, I mean, but some people will look for this species or this family mushrooms, the morels, in the spring. Uh, but they are, I'll be honest with you, they are maddeningly elusive in the eastern part of New England. As you get into the western part and the soil pH ticks up a little bit, I find them more easier. But in the eastern part of New England, they're, they're just hard. So this black morel, for example, I typically don't find this way off in the wilderness somewhere. I'll find it like in somebody's yard. Like just, this is a pea gravel just next to the foundation of a house. Or you know by the shrubbery or in the mulch or by the walkways or things like that. And uh, so all these mushrooms are picked just from somebody's yard uh, not far from where I grew up. And uh, now I don't have to explain this to you, but I just have to tell you that when I have kids in the audience, I have to say, kids, do you know what that is? And of course they don't. I have to say, yeah, that's a film canister. We used to have to take <laughs> photos with film. <laughs> and that's in there for scale so you know how big the mushrooms were. All right, so that's the black morel. Then um, here's the yellow morel. And this photo right here, this was almost taken in New Hampshire. This is from Pepperell, Mass. Do you know where that is, near Nashua? And so this is uh, Sue Edwards, who just was house-sitting, and she said, I've got all these mushrooms coming up in the yard. What are they? And she described them and said, I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so uh, all, all those are from one yard. Now, uh, where uh, I tend to find the yellow morel is two places. So the older apple trees, so not the new ones, but when the apple trees have been there for quite some time, and also, American elms, we don't have a lot of them, and yes, they still occasionally get the, elm, uh, the disease and die, but when they die and the bark is still attached to the trunk and it hasn't sloughed off yet, I often find yellow morels growing under those trees. And in Massachusetts, the weekend I check for the yellow morel <coughs> is Mother's Day weekend. So that would be good, or I'd add a week to that maybe for up here. And so I hope you find some. So we'll talk more about mushrooms as we get into summer and fall part in the show. All right, so uh, here's a, a seasonally relevant slide because 
Uh, when you get home from a hike, sometimes you find these burrs in your socks or your dog's fur. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from these burrs, by the way. So this is a plant called Property Love Burdock. It is a wonderfully edible plant. We'll talk about two of my favorite edible parts to it. So one is the root. And a burdock is a biennial. That means it has a two-year life cycle. So the first year and the beginning and the second year, it looks like this. We're just seeing a bunch of these big leaves sending energy down to this big beige taproot. And then the plant winters over, and then the second year, it produces a flower stalk. I'll talk more about that later. So anyway, the root is one of the edible parts of the plant. But unfortunately, you can't just grab the foliage and yank on it and get a root out that way. It will break on you, so you have to dig them out. And it's a lot of work, and I don't usually bother. And if you did, <laughs> I pretty much guarantee that your patience will give out before the root does, because they're very, very long. And so you'd be digging and digging at some point, you say, ah, oh, the heck with it, and you just slice up what you have, and you might have dug up that much. It kept going. And it'll be like three quarters of an inch thick, an inch thick, you know, they're very big. And so what do you do with the root after you dug it up? So an easy way to prepare it, you don't have to peel it, is just to wash it off and then slice it crosswise in half inch thick rounds and boil it in salted water until it's tender, which is about 15 minutes, and it will taste like a starchy artichoke. But as I said, I'm too lazy to do that. Instead, I wait for the second year's growth so in June of the second year, the plant will begin to produce a, a cylindrical flower stalk in the center of the plant. And eventually it gets like three or four, depending upon the species of burdock you have, I get three or four feet tall. And I'm, get, I'm harvesting when it's about a foot and a half tall, cutting at ground level, lopping off the top cluster leaves. So all these burdock uh, flower stalks I gather in less than a half an hour, just on the edge of a school ball field. Um, and you know, it's quite common to find this plant like that or a bike path or edge of a farm field. And, um, and so now the, the stalks, the burdock stalks, the outer parts are bitter and stringy, so I take that part off. But unlike the knotweed, the burdock stalks are solid all the way through. So after you take the outer part off, you have a lot of food value left. And so you take those stems and you just cut them into half inch uh, thick rounds and boil them in salted water till the tender, it's about seven minutes. And then it's a delicious vegetable, just plain, or throw in a spaghetti sauce. It's really good in the recipe, but ordinarily, you take artichoke hearts and you mix it with Parmesan cheese and mayonnaise and breadcrumbs and you bake it in the oven. It's a spread that you put on crackers. Well, you can substitute the burdock, the boiled burdock flour stuck rounds with the artichoke hearts. That recipe works great. That's what it looks like, and this recipe is actually on my webpage. So the handouts I gave you, if you follow the links there, you can find uh, where I am on the internet and uh, just go to the bottom of any of those pages and you'll see where the recipe link is and then you'll find this recipe. All right, so this species I run into more in southern New England than northern New England, but you do have it up here. It's called catbriar, bullbriar, greenbriar. And this time of year, it's just a thorny, woody pain, literally. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but in the spring and in the early summer, it has a tender growing tip like that that's nice and soft. You can just pop it right into your mouth. But I actually like a cousin of this plant even more. It's a plant called carrion flower that looks like asparagus, tastes like asparagus. It's related to asparagus. You prepare it quite like asparagus. So it's an herbaceous, thornless cousin of catbriar. So you see there are the shoots coming up in May. So you just, uh, that's my wife Ellen there. You just harvest them just by snapping them off. And then you just uh, uh, steam them until they're done, like you would asparagus. And yeah, so here we are camping. We're using a Frisbee as a plate here. And you see <laughs> these little guys right there. So those are the flower buds. Now, we, if we had encountered this plant like a week and a half later, it would look like that with the blooming flowers on there. And that's when you discover why it's called carrion flower, because you stick your nose up to that, and it smells just like dirty gym socks or <laughs> rotting meat. OK, so if you encounter the plant when it's blooming, it could be a rather unpleasant experience. But if you harvest it in the spring at the shoot stage, it can be quite good. OK, so this plant, black locust, this considered an invasive species in Massachusetts. I'm not sure what the status is in New Hampshire. But, uh, but anyway, it's very common. And, um, and the edible part of the flowers, and the flowers come out uh, Memorial Day weekend in southern New England. So I would add a week to that for up here. Uh, and um, now you, you're seeing the, the bumblebee in the center of the photo. And you might be saying to yourself, oh, bumblebee, that's a pollinator. We don't want to pick any of those flowers because the pollinators need them. Don't worry in the case of the black locusts, because these trees get to be 30, 40, 50 feet tall. And when they're blooming, they're blooming from top to bottom, thousands and thousands of flowers. The bumblebees can fly up 10, 20, 30 feet and visit those flowers. You can pick some of the flowers that you can reach from ground level. There's plenty to go around. And these flowers are wonderful. They, they uh, smell like jasmine, and they taste like sweet pea pods. So it's fun to just eat them straight off the plant. 
And because this is an invasive species, it's a guilty foraging opportunity to pick all the flowers you want. And uh, you strip them off the central stalks and you could just add them to salads, eat them just plain, or you can make fritters from them. So the recipes in my book, Black Locust Fritters, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, so pokeweed's edible, and you may know the plant from this stage it's in right now. We have these big, shiny, purple berries, which are not edible, by the way. There's nothing edible on the plants now. In fact, uh, the root is always poisonous, and the mature foliage berries uh, is poisonous, too. Now, the poison in the plant is something called phytolactin, which is a purgative. In minute amounts, it might actually have some therapeutic value to you, but if you eat too much of it, it's going to want everything on the inside of your body get to the outside of your body through every available means as quickly as possible. So that would be rather nasty to have to go through that. So you just want to harvest the shoots when they're four to 10 inches tall, and even then you have to boil them for seven minutes to make them safe to eat. But uh, pokeweed will not shrink or get all mushy on you even after all that boiling. So that's what the pokeweed shoots look like. So that's what you want to harvest. So you say to yourself, well, all right, uh, I, I, I might want to try that, but a shoot like that, there's got to be other things that look like that. How would I know that's a pokeweed shoot? Well, here's the big favorite that the plant does for you is that, as you, as you may uh, know, in your brain, uh, the plants are usually about this tall now, and at the end of the growing season, when the cold weather comes, berries fall off, leaves fall off, and that stem loses its color, but it does not disintegrate. It persists as a skeleton through the winter into the following spring, and it will still be there when the shoots for the following year's uh, sprouts come up. So you see right here? So there's last year's growth. And here's the shoots coming up. There's a close-up of them. So if you see that, you see last year's stalks, and then this year's growth, then you, you, you can be confident you got the pokeweed. All right, so milkweed's edible. So pokeweed's got a chapter in my book. Milkweed's got a chapter in my book. And I call the, 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 subtitle, the subtitle of the chapter, the milkweed in my book, is a procrastinating forage's dream food, because there's at least four edible stages to the plant, and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while until the next edible stage develops. Now, by this time of year, we're past all the edible stages. But anyway, uh, so this is actually edible stage number three, the flower buds when they're in a tight green cluster. You use the same cooking method for milkweed that you use for pokeweed. That's one reason why I put them in the show next to each other. You have to boil whatever milkweed part you're cooking for seven minutes. But like the pokeweed, it will not shrink and get all mushy on you even after all that boiling. So there's the flower buds, and look how well they held up after seven minutes of boiling. If anything, they look even better than they did when they were attached to the plant. So you could just eat those like that, just as a side dish, a vegetable side dish, or you can incorporate them into this recipe, which is from my book, this milkweed egg puff, which is like a cross between the souffle and a casserole. And even the pods are edible. When they're about an inch long, you can boil them up for seven minutes, and the texture of the flavor is really similar to green beans. All right. But, you know, milkweed, as we know, is important uh, ecological role for the monarch butterflies. So it isn't just by the way, it's only the common milkweed, this one right here, that's edible by people, so none of the other milkweed species are, so swamp, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed aren't edible by people. But anyway, but the, but the monarch butterflies will seek this one out, as well as the other ones, and lay their eggs on it, and the caterpillars are eating the leaves, and so on. So I wouldn't want to do anything that in any way is going to make the plants less numerous for the butterflies to find them. And so this is a plant I'm actively propagating and planting, and let me just tell you how I walk the walk in my own yard, my own house. So there's my old car, there's my boat, there's my house behind, and then next to our driveway, we've got some blueberry bushes, and we let the milkweed grow amongst the blueberries. And uh, butterflies find them, because there they are visiting the uh, milkweed plants, and we know that they had uh, you know, laid some eggs in the caterpillars ate the leaves, because one day we went out, and there was a crystals attached to our garage door. And fortunately, it attached to one of the hinges, so when the door went up and down, the crystals just went for a ride up and down. <laughs> and it, it was there for a couple weeks, and then one morning we went out, and you know, the, the thing was empty, because the butterfly metamorphosed and flown away. So yeah, so that's a good way to you know, make up for uh, you know, any gathering in the wild you're doing, is to plant the plants in your own yard. So there's a whole chapter on cattails in my book, and I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about eating cattails, but there's uh, lots of different parts. So the immature bloom spike is one of the nice parts to eat in the cattail, and that's uh, in June, you're gonna see a swelling near the top of the plant. You pull the outer leaves away, and you're gonna see these immature flowers there. So that's a male flower on top and the female flower below, and you boil them up, and the, and the texture of the flesh on those flowers tastes a lot like a cross between corn and artichokes. 
And at the same time, you can harvest the, the heart of the plant, which is the tender stem below where the immature flowers are. So you pull the outer leaves away, and all of a sudden, the stem that's very, very stiff when the outer leaves are surrounding it, when you pull them away, it starts getting really soft and wobbly. And that's, uh, you can eat that right on the spot. It's uh, kind of like a cucumber, a heart's a palm. And then the cattail pollen. Once the males emerge from the hiding and they turn yellow at the top, you just go into the swamp with a bag and just bend the flower into the bag, give it a little shake, and this big cloud of yellow pollen comes off. So you can collect uh, more than a cup uh, quite quickly and then just bring that home and put it through a fine mesh sieve just to intercept any beetles, anything else that got in there. And then you can add that cattail uh, pollen to flower to make these gorgeous looking, very nutritious cattail pollen, muffins, crepes, and other big products. All right, anybody know what this plant is? So where I tend to see this plant is in cow pastures because it's a really spicy plant and I don't think the cows like to graze on it. It's a plant called sweet flag. And this is one of our, the, uh, our native plants. There's, a, there's a, a native one and a European one that look very similar. They're usable the exact same way. But Native Americans like this plant. Uh, they used it medicinally um, as well. And so um, they, they definitely planted this one uh, to places where it would be useful to them to have it. And uh, the whole plant is spicy and gingery, uh, almost too much so. But if you harvest it this spring and you pull the outer leaves away, you're just eating the yellowish tender leaves in the center of the plant. Uh, those are quite mild and, and they have that ginger flavor. Okay, so this is a plant that, uh, so I had a little bit of time before I uh, showed up to the library today and I went to the Gunstock Resort, which I love to ski at, by the way. I'm a cross country skier, so that's what I do there. And I'm very grateful that you have this fine facility up here. Uh, and you know, the way that climate change is working, sometimes, you know, it's rain where I live, outside of Boston, and snow up here, so, you know. So thank you for sharing your wonderful snow with me. Uh, all right, so I saw basswood growing. I saw the leaves just along the trail there. That's why I mentioned it. Uh, but there's also, if, if you go down to Boston, you're going to see a lot of the little leaf linden, the Tilia cordata, planted as a street tree. They're edible the exact same way, so whether it's a native basswood or the uh, introduced species. Uh, the young leaves are edible. Um, uh, they're very mild and tender and mild flavored. And then the flowers, when they come out, and this would be in the very early part of the summer, uh, the flowers have this uh, uh, lemon honey type flavor. You make a tea from it, and you can use the flowers fresh or dried, and it's very nice flavored tea. It also has two medicinal uses. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. Okay, so this is a very common site in April, in early May in New Hampshire, as you're, uh, especially heading up from the valley up into the higher regions, you often see these uh, trees blooming along the side of the road. So those are shadbush uh, uh, plants, and they'll bloom two weeks before the crab apples bloom. So it's one of the earliest blooms. So this is, although it's a plant that does grow wild up here, it's also one of our native species that I see a lot in parks and other landscaped areas because of the early blooming, I think that's considered a nice landscape feature. And so, but this is a good time to spot the plants because when the fruit is ripe, it's this kind of uh, purple color, which is hard to see at a distance. So it's good to know where the plants are already. And so you can figure that out at the blooming time. And so there's a close up of the fruit and you see it looks a lot like blueberries, but it doesn't taste at all like blueberries. It tastes like a cross between cherries and almonds because it's actually related to cherries and almonds. They're all related plants in the rose family. So. Uh, so this is a fun one for stuffing your face right by the tree. Uh, and in my book, I've got a couple recipes using it. And there's mulberries, which are ripe at the same time. Uh, and mulberries are, um, I don't think anybody is planting these, except maybe in some permaculture places like Dean Acres up in, in, uh, in uh, uh, near Romney, New Hampshire. They have a mulberry. But, um, but juneberry and mulberry are ripe at the same time. And so I like to mix them together and make strudel out of them. Uh, and uh, wild strawberry, you're very lucky here in Northern New England because you have much more frequent and extensive and larger wild strawberry patches than we do in Southern New England. And as you know, it's like end of June, beginning of July is when you wanna go out and, and, and pick them. And yes, the fruits are small, but, um, but it's really fun. And a nice sunny early summer day, to just sprawl yourself out in a patch of wild strawberries and just loll around there and just stuff your face with all the wonderful strawberries, giving off the wonderful aroma. 
Now you can make a tea from wild strawberry leaves when the, tea, when the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic. But fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea that you make from the leaves does taste vaguely like the fruit. And it does have vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you can rush out and make yourself some strawberry leaf tea. Now, daylilies are edible, and let me say two things. First of all, the only daylilies I can vouch for in terms of being uh, safely edible by most people are the tall orange ones, the ones that you do see growing wild. They're all, all other kinds of daylilies now, and uh, I understand that some of the horticulturalists and their zeal to come out with snazzy new versions of flowers, that they're actually mixing species together, and they might even, I don't think they're using CRISPR, but I think they're using you know, some uh, techniques which they could be incorporating species of other lilies. I have no idea if those are safe to eat or not. So if you're just eating the old-fashioned, tall, orange daylily flowers, they're edible. And I suspect that many of you have already eaten daylily flowers. If you've ever eaten the Chinese dishes, mushu or hot and sour soup, they use dried daylily flowers in those recipes usually. So daylily tubers are edible below the ground. The young sprouts are edible. The daylily flower buds, the open flowers and wilted flowers are all edible. Here's the, here's the one caveat, though. That's why you see the asterisk up there. There is a principle in daylilies that for a certain you know, small but significant portion of the population, I believe it's less than 20% of humans, but you could be one of those people, there's a chemical in daylilies that might not agree with the digestive system. So if you eat daylilies, you might find that you feel nauseous and or you'll have a loose bowel movement after you eat them. But if that happens, you'll get better right away. You're not gonna have flashbacks later on or anything. You'll just know that daylilies don't agree with your digestive system. This seems to be triggered mostly from the raw tubers, but it's possible that other parts of the plant might do it too. So this is a good time to mention that allergies. It is possible that you could be allergic to an edible wild plant or mushroom and not know it simply because you've never been exposed to that particular species before. So the standard advice is to not eat a huge amount of some new food you're trying for the first time just to make sure that you don't break all out in hives or whatever. But if in general you're not allergic to conventional fruits, vegetables, and stuff, it's very likely you'd be allergic to the wild counterparts because chemically they're really similar. All right, so jewel weed. Um, so I think it's gotten cold enough up here that you can't find this plant anymore, but if you turn the clock back just a couple weeks, you would have been able to find it. And um, so this is a summer, early fall uh, edible. And the edible part are the seeds inside the seed pods, and I'll talk about them for just a second, but the, the juice inside the succulent plants is used as remedy for the stinging, stinging nettle. It's been clinically proven to cure poison ivy for some people. I'm apparently not one of those people, but it does work for some people. And, uh, uh, and some people claim that that juice is good for all kinds of skin irritations, even athlete's foot. So that's good, that's the medicinal use. The edible part is the seeds. And so what you wanna look for is a seed pod like that that's just about to explode. Because one of the nicknames of this plant is touch me not, because if you brush against the plants when the ripe seed pods are on there, they start detonating on me. They go, they shoot all over the place. So, if you want to eat those seeds, what you need to do is sneak up on a seed pod like that <laughs> and grab it and have it explode in your hand. Don't worry, it won't hurt. And then uh, you see all this curled up business here. Those are the springs that made it explode. And then inside, letter D here, are the ripe seeds. And they taste just like walnuts, like store-bought English walnuts. And uh, I mean, they're small. They're less than an eighth of an inch long, but it's a fun thing to nibble on uh, in the woods. Another cool thing you can do with those seeds is if you take a ripe seed and you gently rub the outer covering off, you get letter E there. You get to see the inner color of the seeds, which is this beautiful, bright robin's egg blue color. And I have no idea why that color's in there, because no creatures ever see it. It's just one of those unexplained mysteries of Mother Nature. All right, purslane. So this is another plant that isn't around anymore because it uh, uh, disappears quite quickly once the cool weather comes. But in the summer, it's really common farm and garden weed and it's edible raw, it's edible cooked. Uh, the leaves are edible, the stems are edible. The, some people will pickle the stems. So this is another plant I'm gonna show you a way to use it that requires no cooking skill at all, is you can throw the purslane leaves in a gazpacho. Now, if you're you know, growing vegetables at home and you have you know, lots of the ingredients for making your own homegrown chunky gazpacho, by all means, do that. Or you could just be lazy and go to the fancy produce store and just buy their gazpacho and then throw the purslane leaves in there and the texture of the purslane works really well in a gazpacho. All right, so here's flowering raspberry, and this is a cool plant that you might want to grow in your yard, definitely grows in Guilford, uh, and I'm gonna tell you a story about this plant in just a second. Uh, 
So these flowers are about two inches across, which is quite showy for, remember, the raspberry blackberry thing? And these enormous maple-like leaves. And this plant doesn't have thorns on the stem. So this is a plant worth growing in your yard, even if you never ate it, just to look at it. So that's what the fruit looks like. All right, now one story I haven't told you yet is since I retired from my day job at the Mass Fish and Game Department back in 2015, I'm playing the role of Johnny Appleseed for native edible species. And I've set up a nursery outside of Boston where I'm propagating over a thousand plants, most of which I grew from seed that I gathered myself. And then I work out arrangements with cities and towns and land trusts and state and federal agencies and organic farms and tribal groups and others to plant plants for my nursery in appropriate places and their properties. So, now I have to tell you a story about cross-country skiing at Gunstock. So one year, a few years ago, my wife and I are there skiing there, and we're on the trail that you may know when you, when you go to the entrance to Gunstock, the first trail that you cross it goes along a brook. You know, if, and so if, you, know, so you, you check in and get your trail pass at the, at the center there where the campground office is. And then uh, you ski downhill, and then you start at the bottom of the hill, and then you work your way up to the top by going along this brook. So we're skiing along this brook. It's January. It's really, really cold. And I see some dried up fruit that I recognized as uh, flowering raspberry fruit, because I know what the canes look like and everything. And I said, I can gather that fruit and grow a plant from it. And so I did. I gathered seeds. And I have at least two dozen plants in my nursery from seeds I gathered while I was cross-country skiing a really cold day in January from Guilford. OK, so anyway, this is what the fruit looks like when it's going to find ripe in the summer and the early fall. Now, I'd be misleading if I said, oh, these fruits are just as good as red raspberries, because they're not. They're a little bit on the dry side. Red raspberry fruit is going to be juicier, but these are perfectly edible and, and if you encounter them. So black raspberry, I don't need to tell you what to do with black raspberry fruit, but I'll just point out that one of the cool things that black raspberry does is in the off season is the canes turn this purple color. So it's really fun to find them, going back to cross-country skiing when you're doing that in the winter, walking a dog, whatever, and you're like on the edge of a field and you see those purple thorny canes, those are black raspberries, remember where they are, and then go back in early July and look for the fruit. Okay, so here is a native species called Indian cucumber, and this has a delicious part, it's the root. So there's my wife, and you see the roots there in the bottom. So they grow horizontally to the stem, and they're about as big as your pinky, and they taste like a starchy cucumber, and they're quite good. Okay, but there's two things that uh, you need to be cautious about in harvesting this plant. First thing is, it's very hard to avoid killing the plant to harvest this edible part. And so I'm not even thinking of harvesting these plants unless I'm seeing many, many plants. I'm talking about over 100 plants in an area. And there are places in, in New Hampshire where I have seen many, many, many uh, any cucumber plants. So if you're seeing lots of those, you know, pulling up a few to eat them is not going to be that big a deal. But the other issue is there is a, 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 a listed species, a federally listed rare plant that bears a very strong resemblance to the uh, Indian cucumbers. So, and that's this one, the small world pagonia. And so, uh, so you don't want to mix them up. So the, the botanical name for this one is Mediola virginiana. The botanical name for this one is Isotria medialoides, which means looks like Indian cucumber. <laughs> so how do you tell them apart? Well, you see on this one, you've got the uh, orchid flower coming out of the center there in this little stem like that. And on the Indian cucumber, you see that the bigger plants have this double-decker thing going on, where you have the whorl of leaves and then a second like the stem, and then a second whorl of leaves where the flowers and the fruit form. So if you're only harvesting the double-decker Indian cucumber plants, you're never going to pick the rare orchid by mistake. And the double-decker plants have the bigger roots anyway. Okay. So elderberry, so where you're going to find this plant is where it is sunny and meadowy and damp. That's where these plants like to grow. And some people will collect the flowers and make a drink from them. There's an alcoholic version, there's a non-alcoholic version. Um, uh, some people will fry these flowers in fritter batter, but I think the black locust flowers make a much tastier fritter than the elder flowers. So I, I, and, and the other thing about picking the flowers off the plant, you're not going to get any fruit on the plant if you pick the flowers off. You have to leave the flowers on the plant to get the fruit. And this is what the fruit looks like. Um, and that photo is an upside down. That's what the fruit clusters tend to do from the weight of the fruit is hang upside down like that. And I understand you can get a stomach ache if you eat a lot of raw elderberries just plain, but if you dry them first or you cook them first, you can eat all you want. I like to mix elderberries and apple together, so like elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is more interesting than just plain apple sauce or apple pie. Spice bush. So this is a plant that really 
you know, you might run into it in the Lakes region, but it's really more common further <coughs> south. But I did check uh, that there, there are documented occurrences of it growing here, but you can absolutely plant it here if you wanted to. And um, this is one of our native species the American colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era. They were boycotting the British tea. They would just steep the twigs in hot water for a few minutes. You do this any time of year. I like to eat the berries, and it's not like, you know, oh, I sat down to a bowl of spice bush berries, and boy, was it good. No, it's a spice. And so it would be like eating a bowl of black peppercorns. <coughs> you never do that. All right. So that's what these are like. They have that, that flavor or a Szechuan pepper flavor. It's a very savory flavor. So what I'll do is dry the berries for several weeks and then store them in a little glass jar in my pantry, and they'll keep for years without going rancid. And then I'll grind up a few and just add them to a food like that milkweed egg pup I was showing you before. I use dry, ground up dried spice fish berries in that recipe. It works well. So, but um, these berries are high in fats. They're, they're very oily. And the songbirds know this. And so they'll seek out these berries to help fuel their southward migrations because they need to have, you know, fat enough to do that. So uh, if you're gathering spice fish berries in the wild, it's really important to leave lots of berries on the plant to make sure the birds get all they need. And another cool critter you might see on a spice bush plant is this critter called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So when this caterpillar first hatches and it's about a half an inch long, it looks just like bird poop. So that's an ingenious disguise. No bird is going to eat bird poop. That works. And then as it gets like an inch, an inch and a half long, it changes into this appearance where uh, these are fake eyes. The real eyes are down here. So the caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake. So that works, and even at the pupa stage, it looks just like a dried leaf. So isn't it amazing how this organism has evolved all these ingenious disguises to evolve, uh, avoid being eaten? Okay, so here is wintergreen, and this can be a common plant up here, um, and uh, and it will have the wintergreen flavor. The berries have the wintergreen flavor. They're not that sweet, but they do have the wintergreen flavor. Uh, and you could make a drink from these, but I tend to make the drink from yellow or black birch, and I gave you a handout about how to do this, and I made some for you. So at the end of my talk today, I have some for you to try. It looks like that right there. You can do this any day of the year. Anytime you find a yellow or black birch, you just gather up a bunch of the twigs, and you just peel them to expose the flavor, which is in the inner bark, and then take the peeled twigs and the peelings and just stuff them in a jar full of water and let it sit around for an hour. That's it. So you get a chance to try that in a second. It's going to taste like drinking a wintergreen flavored lifesaver. All right, so now we're in the summer, so I could talk to you about mushrooms. So uh, this sulfur shelf mushroom, sometimes called the chicken mushroom, this is way at the safe end of the line. The only look-alike I know of to this mushroom is another edible mushroom. So what do you want to look for? So the top part is this bright pumpkin orange color. The bottom part is this bright sulfur yellow color, kind of like the sulfur in chemistry class in high school. And, uh, and it's growing on layers directly on wood. And it could be a standing tree, live or dead, or it could be a stump or a log. And if you look on the underside of the cap, you'll see there's no gills. Gills are the things that radiate out, like the spokes of the wheel underneath the cap of the standard store-bought mushroom. So no gills on this at all, just these pores. That's where the spores are dropping out. And a mushroom, oops, sorry, and a mushroom like this, uh, you just trim the outer layer off. That's going to be the yummy part right there, like that inch and a half out there. And if you can slice through it really easily, like uh, butter, that's great. If you hack away at it, it's going to be uh, uh, pretty indigestible. And so uh, it's called the chicken mushroom because if you pull the mushroom meat apart, it looks just like the breast meat of a chicken. So you can use it like the breast meat of a chicken. So you can make chick uh, sulfur shell fajitas, sulfur shell papakash, sulfur shell tetrazzini. We've done it all three ways. It's good in it, all those ways. All right. So uh, then here is the cousin of the sulfur shelf, where the color might be more pink and white rather than orange and yellow. Uh, but these are at least as good as the, the sulfur <laughs> shelf version. So chanterelle, so your standard chanterelle, which can be quite numerous here in the lakes region, this is not uh, at the safe in the line. There are uh, poisonous lookalikes to the chanterelle. So I'll try to help you a little bit on it. So what things I'm looking for is the color of the stem and the color of the cap are the same. They're not different. Also, this color is the same color as an egg yolk or the center stripe in the middle of the highway. And then if you look on the underside of the cap, there are these things like here, which are not separate structures like gills. They're just ridges uh, that come up just, uh, uh, just very, they're very shallow on the underside of the cap. And they fork as they go out toward the end 
and also they're called decurrent, which means they run down the stock a little bit. They're not stopping just at the top of the cap. So that's things you want to look for. And, and they're growing singly on the ground. They're not growing in clusters. So if you remember all that, then you'll uh, safely pick the chanterelle. So here are a bunch of chanterelles in the center of the photo here. And on the outside is this cool mushroom called a lobster mushroom, which starts out as an inedible lactarious white mushroom. And then it's colonized by this orange cooked lobster colored mold. And it converts what was an inedible mushroom into an edible mushroom. So that's a, a fun one to find. So the French have a name for this mushroom. They call it trompette de la mort, which means trumpets of death. But that's only because it's black. It's actually a totally safe <laughs> edible mushroom with no poisonous lookalikes called the black trumpet chanterelle. So uh, does anybody know where Stone Dam Island is? OK, so Stone Dam Island is in Lake Winnipesaukee. It's actually, uh, uh, almost all of it, I think, now is protected by a land trust. And as far as I know, it's OK to pick mushrooms there. And if I'm wrong, I apologize for telling you about this place. But I actually know the family that used to own the island that turned most of it over to the land trust. And many years ago, we're out there at a summer weekend camping on this island. And the conditions were favorable. It was warm. It had been rainy. And so I said, well, let's go mushroom hunting. And so we found uh, some black chanterelles. The hardest thing is finding the first one. Because they're black, they're small. They're only about two or three inches tall. So they're hard to see. But once you see the first one, just stop in your tracks and look around. And often you'll see dozens, sometimes hundreds. And we were seeing thousands. Let's turn them out. We actually got bored picking them. There were so many. It's like, all right, enough already. You know? uh, so, um, so one nice thing about the black chanterelle is that if you do, you know, find a, a mother load and a whole bunch of them, they dry very well. And so that will, you could dry them and then just store them in your pantry, keep them for years, and, and eat them later. You don't have to eat them all right away. So, all right, so there's another one I find in this area of New Hampshire. This is called a hedgehog or a sweet tooth mushroom. And, uh, and for those of you in the back that can't see, the underside of the cap, it has these teeth hanging down like the roof of a cave. There are no poisonous tooth mushrooms. There are some that don't taste good, but there aren't any that would make you sick. And this one, it has kind of a felty top to it. That's what it feels. And sometimes like, the cap is a little irregular in shape. So look for that. And then the teeth, I typically find these under hemlock trees. And uh, in an ordinary year, we could still find them now. But um, because of the lack of rainfall, I, I think they've been pretty scarce this year. OK, so the only lookalike to the mushroom in the center of this photo is a volleyball. That is a giant puffball mushroom. And that particular mushroom isn't even that big as puffballs go. They can be more than twice that big. So puffballs are edible if they are firm and white. White in the outside, white in the inside. They can't be any other color. They can't be yellow or purple or green or any other color. And a mushroom like that, standard way to cook it is just to slice it into half inch thick steaks, roll it into a beaten egg, and then roll it into some seasoned breadcrumbs or cracker crumbs, and fry, fry it in a skillet and some butter, and make country fried puffball steaks. And that one mushroom could easily feed everybody in that photo. Mm -hmm. OK, so this is a Boletus edulis, which I do find in uh, the Lakes region. And so this is a bolete family mushroom. And their main characteristic is that this is a spongy layer on the unside, underside of the cap. So no gills, like I showed you before. Uh, and so the way to know the, the Boletus edulis is that uh, this cap color is the same color as a loaf of baked bread. So look for that. And then that spongy layer on a mature specimen is going to be this color, which is an uh, olive yellow color. Uh, but in a young specimen like this, it's going to be white right here. But the key thing to look for is this stuff right here. This is called reticulation. It looks like somebody took a, a piece of gauze and wrapped the top of the stock, and it's white. And so the combination, everything I told you, you know, the, the, the spongy layer, white or olive yellow, the color that's loaf of baked bread, and then this uh, uh, white neck-like marking near the top of the stock, that's the uh, uh, porcini mushroom. And, um, and these also dry really well. So if you luck out and you find a whole bunch of them, you could dry them and then keep them for a long time. OK, so here are two species I tend to find in this part or, of New Hampshire or further north into the White Mountains. Um, now, they both bruise blue. And some people that teach mushroom hunting advise beginners don't eat any boletes that bruise blue. Uh, and you can see just touching the mushroom here, this one's bruising blue, this one's bruising blue. So. Um, um, 
there are some mushrooms that bruise blue that could give you a bad stomach ache. I don't know any that would require you to go to the hospital, but I wouldn't want you to have a bad stomach ache. So, uh, but here are two species that are exceptions to that rule that bruise blue and, and yet are good. So this one's called Dropper cyanescens or the bluing boli. And this mushroom is the same color as straw. And you just give it the slightest little rub anywhere in the mushroom and it instantly turns this really dark indigo blue color. And uh, this one I tend to see uh, at a certain elevation. So once you get above the spot where it's mostly hardwoods and you get into the conifer trees, that's where I start running into this one. And actually the one to the right there, the bay bowl, it's true for that one too. Uh, and so you see that one has got a uh, 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 very light colored yellow uh, color to the spongy layer here in the cap, and that bruises blue too. So, uh, so I would put these more in the intermediate category rather than the safe category, but I'm about to show you one uh, okay, so that's blue bully. This one, the chrome-footed bully has no other lookalikes than this one. So if you see a mushroom with this pink top and this bright yellow foot and the the uh, the, the spongy layer, which I'm sorry, I should have flipped one over to show you, it's uh, uh, white or off-white. So the combination, you know, pink, bright yellow, and off-white spongy layer there. There are no other mushrooms that have those three characters. You're finding that one, you know for sure it's a chrome photo bully. And when these are young, uh, they're quite good. They're, they're not quite as good if they're old, but if they're young, they're, they're good. And basically the way to tell a mushroom's age is the shape of the cap. When a mushroom is young, it has a bell-shaped cap like that. And as they get older, the cap splays out like that. So if you see a mushroom with a really splayed out cap like that, it usually means it's old. Okay, so here's a cool mushroom. Uh, I have seen this one in northern New England, although it's more common in southern New England. It looks like a piece of meat hanging on a tree. And you see I've cut it in half. It is marbling like a piece of meat. You squeeze it, red juice comes out like a piece of meat. So, so far my favorite way to prepare this mushroom is just to brush it with a little teriyaki sauce and grill it at Hana Apache like a piece of meat. And then this is a cauliflower mushroom. This I find at the base of pine trees around Labor Day weekend. And there's another view of it. So it's way at the safe end of the line. It looks like a big, massive, yellowy egg noodles. But it's a mushroom. But you cook it up and it tastes like mushrooming egg noodles. So it's one of my favorite mushrooms. Here's one I definitely find up here. This is called the bear's head tooth mushroom. And it grows on beech trees, often at eye level, like this one is here. And it looks like a frozen waterfall hanging on a tree. And it tastes like, the texture's like crab meat. So uh, we just had some the other day. Uh, just uh, worked into a frittata, um, uh, it's very good. And you might still be able to find those. Okay, this is probably the most bizarre organism in the show. This is a fungus called corn smut that gets into a developing ear of corn and it swells up the little kernels and turns them gray. And I have to admit, this is not the most appetizing looking thing I ever thought about putting in my mouth, but you can see I'm quite excited having found this because I heard that this is a delicacy in Mexico. In fact, if you're a peasant, in Mexico, and you found this growing on your corn, you weren't even allowed to touch it. You'd have to send for an emissary, the emperor, to collect it, and it would go off to the royal courts, and only the royalty could eat it. So I thought, all right, it must be good. So I took this mushroom, and I cooked it like you cook any standard mushroom, a little butter, a little onion. And I took one bite, and it tasted like mud. And I thought, what is the big deal about this thing? So I thought, I'll try it one more time. So I cooked it in a Mexican style with some hot peppers, some some po plo, some po poblano chiles, and there's some kind of chemical that transformation that happens for the capsaicin, the things that make hot peppers hot, and the corn smut, and that made it taste good. So that, that was the secret. Okay, so here's Hen of the Woods mushrooms, and uh, when you have large, old oak trees, look for these. And the larger and older the tree is, the more likely you're gonna find these. So I have seen several of these this year, but because of the drought, they've been rather scarce. Last year, most mushroom hunters I knew got bored picking them, we were finding so many, it was like, Oh, what do I do with another one of these? Because you've already filled your freezer full of them. You've already made all these stuff with them. And so, uh, so there's a close-up what you want to look for. So this is a cousin of the sulfur shell. It's not going to grow right on the wood. It's going to grow at the base of the oak tree. And, um, and that's a pretty typical size specimen right there. And they can be gray or beige, you know, various uh, combinations of that color. And I actually like to harvest them when they're really young, when they're only about five inches in diameter because then the entire mushroom is nice and tender and mild. All right, so I got about 15 minutes left in the show and then I'll take questions and we can try the samples I brought. We're good? All right, so um, 
Okay, so when I give talks in Southern New England to these people that don't know nature very well, a lot of people in the audience see this and they say, oh, poison sumac, right? Wrong. <laughs> uh, that's what poison sumac berries look like. So this plant with these tight upright clusters of red berries is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. So this is the species you're most likely to encounter up here. This is the staghorn sumac, but it's also wing sumac and smooth sumac are quite common in New England. They also have these tight upright clusters of red berries. So this is described in my book, but you make a drink from the berries. And so you just pick the berries off the plant. And then to make the drink, you just put them in water and rub them. And you're getting the flavor off the berries into the water. So you're not actually eating the berries. You're just getting the flavor into the liquid. So you do that for a while, and the water will turn this pinkish orange color like that. And then you take this and you pour it through any kind of a filter, like a paper towel. And then what goes through, you can drink hot or cold, sweet or unsweetened. I typically drink it cold and sweetened, like pink lemonade. And there it is, and I have some for you that I made uh, just a couple days ago. So you can try it in just a few minutes. OK, so uh, now I did check, and this species does grow this far north. So uh, where I'm from, uh, you know, maybe not so much the city suburban people, but the folks that live, you know, in more rural areas, they'll say, oh yeah, this happens all the time. In September is I'll be walking, riding my bike along, and all of a sudden, grapes, where's that smell coming from? And they follow the nose to the vine, and they find the ripe grapes on there, and they just stuff their face by the vine. So this is the fox grape, the vitus labrusca, which I grew up calling the conquer grape, but actually the conquer grape is a cultivar. It's a domesticated cousin of this plant. This plant, though, the, the fruits are really similar. They're big and they're very grapey. Um, and uh, so uh, this, it was hard to do this this year because of the drought, but in an ordinary year, I can easily fill up baskets like this filled with these delicious grapes. And then I'll make a puree from them. And then uh, my wife made this grape cheesecake one time. It was really good. But I'll typically just make grape sorbet, which is very good and very easy. And uh, so here's another species that we also have in New England. This is called the Riverside grape, where these grapes might still be around now, but they're smaller and they're kind of musky flavored. They're not going to be as yummy as the fox grape. But some people say that this species is the one they prefer to make the stuffed grape leaves. Now, you're not gathering leaves this time of year to make stuffed grape leaves. This would be in the summer, uh, like June uh, or July. And the riverside grape leaves are smooth and green on the underside, so that's the way to tell them apart from the fox grape leaves, which are furry on the underside. And so, yeah, so you just uh, stuff these, and there's the stuffed riverside grape leaves, the kind of thing that's really fun to serve the company, and they'll be really impressed when they find out that they're wild grape leaves that you picked and stuffed yourself. So I'm happy to tell you there's no poisonous species of viburnum. There's several different edible kinds and uh, um, that taste good. And so here's wild raisin. This one grows up here. Um, and then uh, nanny berry. This one grows up here. And then uh, the one I like even more is hobblebush. And hobblebush is what you're going to find uh, in the woods. So it's not a plant that grows in the sun like the first two I showed you. This one grows as an understory plant underneath hardwood trees, uh, usually where there's a little bit of dampness. And uh, I can't tell you a specific spot in Guilford to find this, but I'm sure it's here. But I'll tell you one spot you all know, and that's Mount Cardigan. So whether you hike from the Appalachian Mountain Club side on the south or the State Park side in the north, either way, you're going to run into a lot of the hobble bush on the way up. And if you do it in September, you'll be able to find the ripe fruit that looks like that. So it's black when it's ripe. And the texture is like a stewed prune with a kind of a clovey flavor going on. So it's a very fun thing to nibble on uh, as you're hiking in the woods. All right, so anybody know what this plant is? I bet everybody's eating this plant. Wild rice? Yes, wild rice. Very good. So, um, so wild rice does grow in New Hampshire. It grows in Massachusetts. I have never, however, myself gathered my own wild rice because it's a lot of work. So you have to pick it. Big deal. I pick stuff all the time. But then you have to parch it and winnow it. And so it, it's only worth the effort, I think, if you're processing a lot of it, uh, which I haven't done. So I buy my wild rice from the Ojibwe Indians, the Chippewas, it, from the lakes in northern Minnesota, where they're gathering in their traditional way, where they'll just paddle in a canoe into the patch of the uh, wild rice plants. And they take these sticks called knockers, and they bend the plants over the boat with one knocker, and then they whack the top with the other knocker, and the ripe grains fall into the boat. And uh, some Anglo person saw this happening and said, this is a really wasteful process because look at all these rice grains going in the water. You know, I could devise a system for you are capturing way more. 
and looked at him and said, you're just not getting it, are you? I mean, that's the wildlife food that falls into the water. That's the duck share. Also, that's how we get plants next year, is we're letting some of the ripe grain fall into the water. And you know, so they have perfected the traditional harvesting method. That's a sustainable harvesting method. So if you ever heard of Winona LaDuke, this is her tribe, and so I just order them from a Native Harvest, you know, her tribe's company, where you know, I buy it from them. So anyway, but it does grow wild here in New England. Hazelnuts grow wild here in New England. I saw some at Gunstock just uh, earlier today. And there's a beaked kind and a common kind. The only difference is the appearance of the husk surrounding the nut. So the nut's ripening inside there, and you see it peeking out right here, and there's the hazelnuts inside the husk. Now, wild hazelnuts are smaller than conventional hazelnuts, and they have the same flavor as conventional hazelnuts. So I'd be misleading if I said, you haven't lived, you try the flavor of a wild hazelnut. It's the same flavor as a cultivated hazelnut. And so you might just say, I'm gonna go to the store and buy hazelnuts, which is perfectly fine, but I have gathered many, many hundreds of hazelnuts. These days, I'm propagating hazelnut bushes from them for my nursery, but I've also gathered them to eat. And the secret of gathering them is to not wait until the um, husk with the developing nut inside falls off the plant because you never find them. The squirrels and chipmunks will get them all before you do. You have to harvest them when they're still attached to the plant. Uh, and in, the, in Massachusetts, it's the second week of September. So I'm gonna guess it's around that time up here too. And I, I picked them underneath power lines. And I don't think it's the magnetic electro, electromagnetic radiation that the plants are getting. It's just all the sun they get. And plus, that's a scary place for a squirrel or chipmunk to be because there's hawks and foxes and snakes and other things that will happily eat them. And there's no cover for them to hide in. So the nuts tend to stay on the plants a little bit longer. So that's where I harvest them. So all oak trees produce acorns, and all acorns are edible. It's just how much tannic acid is in the nut meats that you need to leach out because almost all acorns, they're too bitter unless you leach out the tannic acid. And there's a hot, weather, a hot water way to do it, a cold water way to do it. And I tend to use the acorns from the soft oak species like white oak because they have, tend to have less tannic acid in them. But a lot of people in northern New England, they like to use the red oak because that's the one that you have more commonly up here. Okay, so I've been teaching this subject for almost 50 years. I started when I was in high school. And over many of those years, people would ask just out of curiosity, Russ, what's your favorite edible plant? And for years and years, I wouldn't admit to a favorite one because I thought that's unfair. It's like, What's your favorite child? <laughs> you know, it's a dangerous question. You don't want to answer that. So anyway, uh, but I, I eventually had to relent and say, I do have a favorite. And it is the shagbark hickory. And it's in season right now. So I've been a really happy camper because <laughs> shagbark hickories, like uh, black walnut trees too, and we'll talk about them in just a second, they have very deep roots. Okay, They develop a long taproot. And so they haven't been bothered by the drought this year. Uh, so I'm finding a lot of shagbark hickories. That's one that's in that basket right here. So when we're done, you take a look at them. But it looks the same as uh, that basket right there, okay? So in a, in a typical season, I'm filling up many baskets full of the nuts like that. And then you crack them open, you get the nut meats like that. And they taste like walnuts and pecans have been lightly sprayed with maple syrup. So they're really good. So. Uh, this recipe is in my book, Maple Hickory Nut Pie, which is like a New England version of pecan pie. And virtually everybody I feed this to say, this is even better than pecan pie. So um, now I can't tell you a specific place where shagbark hickories grow up here. You may know of one, but I can tell you that um, there is a spot uh, in Concord. So uh, you know where the L.L. Bean is in Concord? That's you know where the Panera is, you know, just in the shopping center that's just north of uh, the city? And if you go to the next stop on 93, and you get off and you head west underneath the road on the west side, you're in a floodplain there and there's a farm there. There's shagbark hickory trees lining that road all along there. Now I'm seeing no trespassing signs there, but I have a feeling that if you just gather the nuts on the pavement, I, I can't imagine you'd have a hard <laughs> time uh, with that. And, and also I'd be curious, actually, if it's possible, I'd like to you know, find a landowner, a land manager who owns a place that I want to forage and just to ask them. They love being asked, it's a real courtesy. And the other thing that's good for you is if you are able to find somebody and ask permission and they say yes, which almost invariably I don't know that they do, uh, then you can forage in a really carefree way and you don't have to be looking over your shoulder every once in a while thinking is somebody gonna get mad at me for what I'm doing here. Okay, so uh, yeah, so here's cookies I make from shagbark hickory. I made something else for you tonight that you're gonna get a chance to try. 
And that's the barberries I put the, this jelly, oh, sorry, that's in this uh, thumbprint cookies I make from this wild fruit called uh, the Japanese barberry, where the fruit looks like that. Uh, and I think it makes the best jelly there is. Okay, so black walnuts, I gave you a handout about black walnuts, so there's a lot of details there. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. That's what they look like um, attached to the tree. That's what they look like piled on the ground. And this is the time to look for them piled on the ground. And so as I'm traveling around and I see somebody's yard with a bunch of black walnuts and then I'll go up to their door and I'll knock on it and I'll say, hey, I see you have some black walnuts. Do you mind if I harvested some? And the typical response I get is, wait a minute, let me get my wheelbarrow and fill it up for you because these things are kind of smelly and messy and some people are kind of eager to get them off their property. Somebody actually wants them, uh, they're happy to hear that. So yeah, so I've got, you know, I'm filling up baskets for these uh, black walnuts like this and you have to get this husk off and I explain some tips on how to do that in the handout. And then once you do that, you have the nuts like this and these shells are really hard so they will break most conventional nutcrackers. So I, I advise using a rock or a brick <laughs> or a, uh, a vice, you probably have vice like in your garage or tool shed, whatever, that would work. Uh, here's the device I use. I got this from a company in Oklahoma. It's like a torture instrument from the Middle Ages. And it exerts this <laughs> tremendous amount of torque in the nut, and finally the nut explodes from all the pressure. But this little metal flange, you can drop in the nut, and then the pieces just fall into the tray, and you get some large pieces out like that. And black walnuts, I think I, I have a jar right here with just plain black walnuts. Does anybody here that's gluten intolerant can't eat the baked good that I made? Please feel free to help yourself to some nuts here. And you can also just try the nuts to see what the nuts taste like, just plain. I find them interesting, but I find that where black nuts, black walnuts really excel is when you pair them with honey in various ways to bake things. So this baklava recipe I gave you, it's in the handout that I passed out. And then the black walnut honey squares is what I made for you. And it's right there on the table. So in just a few minutes, you get a chance to try that one. So here's groundnut, and I find this one uh, throughout New Hampshire in sunny, damp, sandy areas where you're likely going to find it. So like in Gorham along the Androscoggin River, you know, way up there it's growing. Um, and um, in the edible part are the tubers, and they're available year-round. So anytime you can find the plant, you can eat the tubers. And so far, my favorite way to use them is just to slice them thinly and fry them in a little vegetable and make groundnut chips. So here's Jerusalem artichoke. And when the first European explorers to this area, like the Jacques Cartier types and the Samuel de Champlain types came, they saw Jerusalem artichoke plants growing everywhere mm -hmm. uh, in Native American encampments. And yet you talk to a botanist and they say, oh, Jerusalem artichokes are native to the upper Midwest. So how did they get here? So they got here because the indigenous peoples of this region traded for it. As we had other stuff like quahog shells, other things that would appeal to the Midwestern tribes, and then we got Jerusalem artichoke tubers in return. And it's very likely that patches, wild patches of Jerusalem artichokes that exist now are patches that were or descended from patches originally established by Native Americans. So the main edible part on Jerusalem artichokes are these tubers, and it's season for Jerusalem artichokes now. So from now until like next May, uh, you can find these uh, uh, just a couple inches down, so you don't even need a, a really big spade you could just use a trowel even if you have nothing you could you know if the ground is easily workable you could use your fingers so not when the ground is frozen don't bother to look for them then and uh there's a mauve colored outside there's a beige color outside it's the same thing just two versions of the same thing and you can use them most ways you use potatoes you can bake them boil them mash them fry them and so on okay so here's autumn olive so that's what the plants look like when they're blooming in the spring in may they have a very nice fragrance there's a close-up of the flowers uh, you've already seen that slide. That's what the fruit looks like. So I find, uh, and where I'm looking for these is places like gravel pits. Now, why are they in gravel pits? Because this plant can do what plants in the pea family can do, is they have the symbiotic bacteria attached to the root systems. They grow in the very nutrient-poor soil, like what's left in a gravel pit. They have no trouble growing in a place like that. And as they say, in the typical autumn, that's what's called autumn olive, because the fruit is ripe in October, uh, that's what it'll look like. And so, uh, so when you find one of these bushes, and the flavor will vary quite a bit from bush to bush, so I'm looking for ones that are quite sweet, because I like to make that fruit leather without having to add any sugar. As it turns out, last couple of years I haven't found fruit that was sweet enough, so I've had to add like a quarter cup of sugar to get it to come out right. Uh, but most of the sweetness is from the natural fruit. Uh, so if you can just, so I find the larger and rounder and redder the fruit, the tastier it is, and, um, and I find that, um, if you can just take your 
your basket like that, just park it underneath the bush and bend a, a branch loaded with fruit mm -hmm. onto it. And with the other hand, you just go tickle, tickle, tickle. And the fruit are falling off really easy like that. It's right. If you have to kind of yank on it, it's not quite ripe yet. And so that's a close up of the fruit. Looks like that. It's red with silvery white speckles on the outside. And uh, so I'm going to show you how to make that fruit leather. It's very simple. So I'm picking, you know, in a typical year, I can fill up a basket like this in less than an hour because, as I showed you, the fruit's really prolific. So I'll bring it home and just pour the fruit into a bowl. And occasionally, you might find one that's moldy in there and just, you know, not fully ripe, whatever. So you fish those out, put them in there, and then the good ones get thrown into this pot here. And then I'm just simmering the fruit with just enough water in the bottom of the pot to keep the fruit from scorching, like a quarter of an inch. So you're simmering it for a while just to get it nice and soft. And then I put everything through a food mill, which is just a sieve with a crank attached to it. If you don't have one of those, you can just use a regular sieve and just use a spoon and push it through. And then uh, all the seeds are held back. You see them to the right. And then you end up with this frothy mauve colored puree, which I poured to trace the food dehydrator like that. And I let it run overnight. And then I get the fruit leather. And I just uh, you know peel it off and then chop it up into little pieces like what you have. So that's it. So besides tasting good, I hope you all thought it tasted good. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it has vitamin C in it. And the USDA did a study on the Automala fruit pulp a few years back, and they discovered that it's up to 18 times higher lycopene content than tomatoes. So it could be very good for you. All right, so here's the last slide in the show. So this document's a really successful foraging day I had almost 20 years ago in central Massachusetts. But a lot of this stuff I could have harvested up here. So. Uh, so there's wild pears over here, shagbark hickory nuts over here, big basket of autumn olives there. Most of these mushrooms are the porcini mushrooms I taught you. This one I didn't teach you. This is called the Argaris, uh, Agaricus arvensis, or horse mushroom. It's a large cousin of the standard stola mushroom. We're probably wondering what the barbecue grill is doing in the photo. Well, somebody had put one of those out with their trash, and I needed one of those at home, so I just foraged for that <laughs> while I was foraging for everything else. So thank you. That is my show. Thank you. Thank you.